But let's read this out loud together. Could you follow along? It's on the screen there. Uh, and uh, we'll just read it out loud together. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Let's try it one more time. Verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. All right, getting our eyes <clears throat> refocused on the Lord to begin our new year, uh, really helping us jump in here, is Psalm 73. As for me, the nearness of God is my good. But what do you do when others find prospering without being near to God? In fact, living a totally wicked life. What do you do when that happens? Uh, maybe New Yorkers of a bygone era, I don't know how bygone this is in some neighborhoods, uh, would have thought of those prospering uh, through the mob mentality, the mafia, meaning the mafia government. This is actually from National Geographic uh, article. Government analysis estimated that in the 1960s, the illicit profit of the nation's 20-odd mob families topped $7 billion annually. Now that is some prospering. And they weren't doing it through going to Sunday school. Uh, they weren't doing it through walking the way of God. They were going through, about this through walking wickedly. Uh, Sal Pelosi this article says, former mafia associate always used a white plastic bag that said, I love New York for his big bank robberies. Um, <laughs> different reasons to love New York. That's soon to be illegal. Not the bank robbery, but the using of plastic bags. In fact, is it the case now? I can't remember. I thought it was the new year. Okay, so organized crime. Uh, we might think of persons like Corella DeVille, right? This is Disney's ultimate immorality, killing Dalmatian puppies. I mean, can you get lower than that? Probably not, at least according to Disney. Wickedness, though prospering, this lady is prosperous through wickedness. And there are people, maybe that you know, who cheat and steal and take advantage and oppress bullies. And, and it seems like they continue to prosper. It's difficult. The psalmist had some real angst about this. He was very frustrated by the fact that he did what was right and he had happened to him what was bad. And then he saw others who did what was wrong and it seemed like things were going very well for them. And so there's the opposite side of this too. Maybe we could understand, okay, the wicked are prospering, but wait a second, the righteous are not circumstantially, and that was even more difficult. I won't want to take too much time with this, but just a couple quick illustrations from the, the most recent Voice of the Martyrs uh, magazine. Uh, Paulus lived a fairly comfortable life with his wife as a devout Muslim. All seemed well. Uh, he would actually persecute Christians, beat them that believed in Jesus, and then he accidentally read the Bible and there was a peace there that he could not ignore. Gained some advice from a local pastor and eventually became a Christian. And that's when, materially speaking, his circumstances went dead wrong. He was doing really good in circumstantial blessing until then. Then, materially speaking, he got persecuted. He got beat by his own family. In fact... Uh, he had to leave his family. After several years, they found him again and beat him again. And the beatings from that caused him to die. He died. From honor, from ease, you meet Jesus, and there's a cross. How about this guy, Kin Mong? All right, we go to Buddhism. Uh, he was a Buddhist with similar sentiments toward Christianity in Myanmar. Successful soldier, family man for 30 years. He was told by his Buddhist monks that Jesus was wrong because he preached, and so he went outside of Buddhism, and so he hated Jesus. In fact, he, was, he would say in prayer to Jesus, 
because he heard that Jesus rose again. He said, if you show up, I'm going to shoot you. He persecuted those who followed Christ, openly berating them, beating them, eventually involved in destroying a church as a soldier. But he made a mistake and, and was thrown in prison. Uh, someone actually stole his gun, and in that case, he had to um, go to prison. And in prison, he met six Christian pastors who introduced him to Christ, and he became a Christian. The Lord miraculously allowed for his freedom. And as he released, he was released, he began preaching Christ. And you know what? Things got worse. Um, he was persecuted. He said, I risked my life shooting guns and killing other people. Now, this war, that war is not important. The more important war I am now fighting against the devil. It is the war that I will fight, even though I suffer the rest of my life. He goes on and shares the story of him being persecuted and beaten, his teeth being knocked out in one village. And as they come to apologize because of what the villagers did, uh, he says, I'm not pressing charges because I forgive them because Jesus forgave me. And four of those people get saved. Uh, beautiful thing the Lord's doing all over the world. This is, this is the news of heaven. This is what the angels are rejoicing on their feed. Right? This that comes up there and they're excited about this. Um, the things to be excited about. But my point here is Asaph's point. Wait a second. Everything was going smooth until they met Jesus. And they professed Jesus, and now everything becomes very difficult. Paul himself, that we've been reading about, would be the same thing. Right? All two readings were from Paul's life. Paul had a successful career. He was wealthy. He was prominent. He was the top of his class in the leading school of his day. Honored by others. Had a purpose, again, persecuting Christians. And then he met Jesus. And everything changed. You read the things that Paul went through. He went from, from comfortable circumstances to horrible circumstances because he met Jesus. The one who stoned Stephen to death begins to be stoned and left for dead. And we have to say with Asaph, what's going on here? Why does God allow this? Many struggle with this fact, and that's why this hymn is written. Uh, this is a song, Song 73, in your books of the songs. A psalm of Asaph, it says. And Asaph struggled with this. Well, who is Asaph? Asaph was a professional songwriter, but he was also a musician, a leader of musicians in David's organization of the temple. Right? You look at the Psalms, many of them are anonymous. Some are written by Solomon. The oldest one is written by Moses. The biggest chunk are written by David. But 11 of them are written by this guy named Asaph. Asaph. Asaph and the descendants, he probably lived to the beginning of Solomon's reign, but the descendants after him actually were also gifted in music, and we find them all the way to Nehemiah's day, still singing and working in music. And so Asaph deals with this issue in song. And the answer to his struggle is the answer to all of our struggle and really helps us fix anew and very well our eyes on God in the new year. And so he has this problem. Verse 1, he's dealing with this problem. Actually, look at verse 1. Um, he states the, the where he's going to go, but verse 2, but as for me, I, I came close to stumbling when I was envious of the wicked. Uh, verse 16 and 17 are kind of the hinge where he changes from looking at the wicked to looking at God. And he says, when I pondered to understand this, all the success of the wicked, it was troublesome in my sight. And so he had trouble with this, verse 16. And then he comes, but as for me, eventually he comes around to looking at God. He finds the solution. So we're going to look at that today, and I'm going to try to quickly walk through it and spend a little more time on the solution than his walking through the sludge of the problem. But let's walk through it together, okay? There's, first of all, the problem, verses 1 through 16. 
And then there's the hinge in verses 16 and 17. And then there's the solution, verses 17 to 28. Okay? So the problem, the first section, and the solution, the second part of the section. And you see that in your notes, uh, depending on what worship guide you have. Probably verses, uh, pages 7 and 8. Verse 1, the problem. He summarizes the problem in verses 1 and 2. There's this truth proclaimed, verse 1, surely God is good to Israel. I know that God is good. And he's going to end up there when he says, but as for me, the goodness, nearness of God is my good. And he, he realizes that. But, and so he starts with that. But then there's this struggle to the truth proclaimed, verse 2. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. All right, so some point in your life, you're going to have things that try to trip you up in your faith. And one of them might be this. I'm looking around at me and I'm seeing the people in my office that prosper, the people in my school that prosper, or the ones that are cheating on the test, or right, the, 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 the people that seem prominent in this city, or the people that seem prominent in this country, or the people that seem prominent in the world, they're not doing the, the nice things. They're not the good Samaritans. And so Asaph has that problem. But as for me, and he looks at this and he kind of, kind of, kind of slips up. It's like I'm almost slipping from my faith. I'm stumbling is the picture. And then he gives an explanation of this troublesome. All right, this is the explanation of the troublesome part. Um, and I really, I got a lot of words up there. We're going to walk through it. You have your Bible in front of you. Oh, you could probably read that. I don't know. What do you think, Jamal? You're on the back row. Can you read that? No? Okay. Brother Mookie can, though. So you just need to move closer, brother. No. I can read it. All right, Danny. Okay. So we did an eye test here. You may want to check that out. Uh, that's about as small as I get in the font, so it's good to know. Uh, for there are no pains in their death. As I read this, just let this, I mean, just think about it, and you're going to get mad too. This is ASAP, but you're going to deal with this too. So just think about this. The wicked prosper in this life. There are no pains in their death. Their body is fat. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Because of that, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly spread oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Because of that, because of their prosperity and their pride, people run from them, verse 10. Therefore, his people return to this place. Waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease, they have increased in wealth. See, a couple prominent characteristics from this paragraph about the analogy, the anatomy of the wicked, they're prosperous. Or look at all the phrases of their prosperity. Verse 3, they're prosperous. You can see why Asaph is having a hard time with this. There's an abundant prosperity Verses 4 and verse 6 say the wicked are fat, right? That, in that culture, it was hard to get food, okay? And, and, and all right, our culture, maybe we don't understand that as much, uh, but, but many, his, his, many of history's cultures had a hard time eating. And so if you had some weight on you, it symbolized, it was a status symbol that you were prosperous. In fact, they were so prosperous that their eyes were bulging with fatness. They were prosperous. They could eat whatever they want, whenever they wanted. And they became fat. They had no lack. The prosperity goes beyond wealth to health, though. They had health. He's like, they keep living this way, and, and yet they're doing okay. There's no trouble or plague on them. They're not in trouble as other men, verse 5. They have health. They don't have pains in their death, verse 4. I think verse 12 is kind of the climax of their prosperity because it says they are at what? They're at ease. You know what word that is in Hebrew? 
Somebody take a wild guess. Shalom. They have shalom. It just seems like, you know, I'm the one crying for peace and shalom, and they're the ones experiencing it. They're just wicked. Characteristic two, not just prosperous. I mean, okay, I understand if someone's prosperous. Praise God for that. For the circumstances that give them prosperity, and that's our whole U.S. culture. But there's also characteristic two, they're wicked. All right, how do you, how do, you do both of those? Verse three, they speak wickedness. Verse six, they're violent. Verse eight, they speak oppression. So they use their prosperity and power to dominate and oppress others who are weak. Verses 8 through 11 paints the picture of their proud, arrogant tongues speaking wicked things in their boastful pride. Yeah, this is one of the six things the Lord hates. God hates pride. And that's their look. And it turns into a mocking against God. And we hear their prayer in verses 8 through 11. God doesn't know. Right, so they speak very arrogantly against God as they vocalize their superiority. And that's difficult. But Asaph gets worse for Asaph because what? it's not just that the wicked are wicked and they prosper. Number two here in, in the difficulty is verses 13 to 15. I do not prosper. <laughs> All right, okay, the wicked are prospering, but you know what? I don't prosper. As far as external circumstances, I don't feel this prospering at all in my life. Why am I going through all kinds of difficulty? Verses 13, 14, and 15. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Look at his description of himself. I've been stricken all day long. It's like somebody keeps punching me in the face all day long. You ever feel beat up all day? That's what Asaph could say, I just feel that way. I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. I wake up to the alarm clock and it's like I'm going to be reproved all day long. And he's like, you know, I, this is my thinking and I really have a hard time even talking about this because I'm afraid those who are weak in the faith will stumble as well. And so he's kind of keeping it in his inside. So we don't know how long Asaph has been struggling with this discouragement. And so he's like, verse 15, I, if I said I'll speak this way, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He's like, I don't want children to be thinking this as well. And so he's, he's going to have to get to a good place. Okay, and he does by the end of the psalm. But you can see where his thinking has brought him. Right, has your thinking ever brought you there? Right? Why, why in the world am I living a pure life? If these other people, I mean, they just seem like they have it. Uh, and and he's, he's, he's going through a difficult time. And so we got to get to the solution. Let's move quickly to the solution. The hinge of the solution, where he turns is in verses 16 and 17. And that's where we transition. 1 through 16 is all about the problem. 17 through 28 is all about the solution. So verse 16 is the summary of the problem. 17 is the summary of the solution. And so really that's a kernel of the psalm. Verses 16 and 17, we find this hinge. Verse 16, the problem, the summarized, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my, in my sight. Right? He's trying to think about it. And this is the problem. Like if you just continue to think about all the problems and all the difficulties, you're going to keep going downhill. And he's like, it was toilsome. It was, it was really hard work to, to, to keep thinking about it. When I pondered to understand this, as I kept mulling this over, it was troublesome in my sight. And so verse 17, the summary of the solution, until, until I came to the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. And this is where we all have to go at every point in all of our lives, at every difficulty. We have to go to the sanctuary of God. We have to look up. We have to look up. We don't look into the bank accounts of the wicked. We look up. We look at God, first of all. This became his stabilizing factor. I came to the sanctuary of God. 
And we're going to meditate on that in a few moments as we continue it through the psalm. But he looks up and that causes him, he gets high enough looking at God to where he can look forward. And I perceived their end. He looks up to God and he sees their end. Their end is on slippery places, as we'll see. And he sees their end and he realizes, I need to go to God. I need to go to God and understand who he is and realize their end is not a positive end. And so let's do that. Let's continue to meditate through the solution, verses 17 to 28. Uh, He's going to continue on here. The solution, a comforting, stabilizing truth. A comforting, stabilizing truth. In these verses, we find that the wicked may be prosperous, but they have a, a temporary prosperity. The wicked have temporary prosperity. As I mentioned in the video this week, there's this circumstantial happiness that is just temporary, and circumstances change. Till I came to the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Surely you have set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. And so he gives us some of these images, the image of, uh, of an ice cliff. And, and they keep going up, they keep climbing the, the ladder, they keep climbing the ladder, and they're up there, but it's very slippery up there. Very slippery up there. Or like a dream, they're just living a dream. And the thing about a dream is it's quick and it's not real, and it ends. And so the dream is a bubble that pops And they realize all these things that God does. Look at that. It's the things that God, you set them up, you will take them down. And I don't need to worry about, in fact, how silly I am to envy them. I need to pity them. This is the the story Jesus shared several times. One he said with the rich man and Lazarus. Now there was a rich man, he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus laid at his gate covered with sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he lifted up his eyes in torment in hell. He cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that they may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off. You see, he looked just a little bit into the future, and there's great pity. There is great pity that we should have on those whose prosperity may even be keeping them from Jesus. And so we find that as part of the solution. Not only the wicked have temporary prosperity, but he continues on, I have permanent prosperity. Verses 21 and 22, his jealousy is so silly. How silly I am to envy them. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within. Right? And, and he felt it. He, he felt it hard. But when I was doing that, I, was, I just wasn't looking at you, God. And I wasn't seeing eternal perspective. And, and I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. I was just like an animal, not thinking about having a soul. I should not have envied them. I should have pitied them. And so my jealousy is silly and my prosperity is God. My prosperity is God. And this is the all important. This is why he can go to the sanctuary and find God as the solution because his prosperity does not come from wealth or from the next promotion. It comes from God. I'm going to look at three aspects of this. Uh... Jesus confronts this uh, picture. That Jesus does confront them. Uh, also, the, the rich that you know, tear down my barns and build greater barns. And he said, you fool. Right? Your, your soul is required of you tonight. Right? So, so why are you just living for this stuff? When God should be our prosperity. Um, look at these, these three truths. And I hope you'll write them down. And you'll really meditate on them. 
This is where we real this is where our soul should go when we really face difficult circumstances in life. Uh, this is where we should go when we struggle with those whose outward circumstances seem better than us, even though they have no thought of God. First of all, God's presence gives us direction. This is why my prosperity is God, because God's presence gives me direction in life. Nevertheless, nevertheless, all this being said, I'm continually with you. Oh God, I'm continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. All right, so God's counsel and his guidance is directing him all along the way. And so it's a beautiful picture of a father uh, holding the hand of a child. God the Father is, is holding our hand and guiding us. That is the leading of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All right, the circumstances don't matter because the Lord, I have the Lord who's leading me. A constant loving hand. And when it's too difficult to walk, he's carrying me. Right? Like the poem, The Footprints, Footprints in the Sand. And so I can face all these difficult circumstances knowing that God is right beside me. God is beside me. And he has led me thus far. He's going to continue to guide me and his counsel, his word will continue to direct me. And so I can face these things because of Emmanuel. Because God is with us. He came to earth to help us. And so we enter the fire, we know there's a fourth man in the fire. We can enter the flood because he closes the door and prepares us for the storm. We may be pinned in by the wall of water on either side, but the pillar of fire and cloud go before us to lead us along the way. And so he is the one who will bring us safely through. He is the one that walks before us. Because of that, I can walk in purity. I can walk in victory. I can walk in light. Because God takes me by the hand and leads me. God's presence gives us direction. Secondly, God's presence gives us delight. All right, God's presence gives us delight, verses 25 and 26. These three principles are so important. God's presence is our delight. Look at this. It would be unusual grace for any of us to say this, but it is the grace that is Christianity. Uh, if you don't have this grace, really, I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to say you're a Christian. Uh, verses 25 and 26, though, though we all go up and down, I realize it in our, in our uh, response to this idea, but 25, whom have I in heaven but you? Beside you I desire nothing else on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Whether in heaven or on earth, God is my great desire. He should be my ultimate joy and delight. Right? And so he says, right, heaven is not heaven without you. Whom have I in heaven by you? And beside you I desire nothing on earth. So if I have God, you see that? So if I have God, I have all I need. And so why am I jealous of the wicked who have exchanged God for all the wickedness that will only lead them to more vice and destruction? Not just temporary, but eternal. And so he's like, I have God and he's all I need. You are my desire. Beside you, I need nothing else on earth. When we drink from a real and vital relationship with God, we need nothing else. I say this before and I say it again, but we can be floating in space completely content to die of starvation because we are with God and we know God. We're, we're communion with him and that's all we really need as humans. As the hymn writer said, not be all to me, save that thou art. Verse 26 puts it a different way. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my what? My portion. Right? Not just like a, a helping of my food, my portion, my inheritance. Right? That all the tribes of Israel were given a portion of land that they had to cultivate. And the Levites were not given that, they were given God instead. God said, You're my, I'm your portion. And this is for all of us, what is our true portion in life? 
God is my portion. God is my inheritance. If I have him, I really need nothing else. God is my lasting delight. And if you find your lasting delight in the person and character of God, then then these circumstantial happinesses can come or go. And when you have them, you're great. And it's okay. Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether I have a lot or suffer need, I can do all things through Christ who shrinks me. I should not find my delight in life in pastoring a church. I should not find my chief delight in life in being a husband and a dad. I should not find my great delight in life in recreation in an app on my phone on television show. Now I'm not saying that we can't enjoy those things. But when we replace our chief delight being in God with these things, it's a misplaced hope and delight. You are made, and I am made, to function best as we find our delight in God. Our heart goes out to the broken people we see all around us because they've tried to find delight in other things. And our world is broken because of it. And all the brokenness you see is stemming from this. That person at work tried to find, they continue to try to find their delight in something else other than God, and they weren't made to work that way. The world tries to climb the ladder of experience, the ladder of success, the ladder of a rush, the ladder of the nightlife of New York City, the ladder of human attainment, the ladder of human of consciousness. All these things we try to climb to find our delight in life, and and, and it's just not going to work. I need to find my delight on my knees before God. Because as soon as you get up to the top and you're the captain of your troop or you're the best quarterback of all time or you're the greatest president or the greatest king or you're the most powerful person in the world, you'll find no lasting delight in any of that. And you realize, what have I lived for? And you'll become depressed. And people do. And so they try to find delight not only in these things that are neutral, but in bad things. Um, And so you see people have just totally given their lives to to drugs. A, a, A numbing of the pain, and it's just this desire that can only be filled with God. People who try to find their identity in sexual experimentation of all sorts, and there's no lasting delight there. Visiting this great site, that great site, this great site, and there's no lasting delight there. I just uh, read a New York Times article about, uh, the the author put it this, as as our culture's preoccupation with jollification and celebration that we're having now. We go to Happy New Year, and then there's uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving, and it's like, okay, take this pill, take this pill, take this pill. Okay, you're not happy now? Okay, well, well, we got Valentine's Day right around the corner. But it's not going to make us happy. Our delight can, can only come from God. As Augustine said, the soul is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Piper puts it this way, God is most glorified in us when we are most, anybody know, satisfied in him. And so he says, we can be a Christian hedonist. If we're finding our joy in God, the only way we're made to, made to have joy, then we can actually give ourselves to that unbridled satisfaction and delight in the eternal God, the fullest expression of humanity, the actual garden experience, is walking with God. It's not eating the fruit. That was Satan's lie. And everything we try to replace with God is just another fruit, another fruit, another fruit. Even good things. I'm saying even good things. But the pleasure of God's presence is what we need. And and, and just real quick here, uh, just another level of application here. Bible, the Bible and prayer is where you find that. Okay, just fine. It's not through meditating in the trees. Where you find God is... The, the place you find God is the Bible and prayer. 
Okay, I realize the faith community, and we have the Lord's table, and all these means of grace, and brothers and sisters, but your primary means through which you develop this is your Bible and prayer. It's spending time developing that joy in God. And so we need to approach our Bible that way. Um, my Bible is not just in academic books so that I can answer the theology test. My Bible is not just a self-help book where I learn principles for living, life hacks for getting through the work week. The Bible is not just a theological, theological treatise, not just a great piece of human literature that I can read and be inspired by these stories. The Bible is where you meet with God and find your soul's delight. It's the gate through which you experience God. Right? The, the, the Bible's importance does not come from it being a book. It comes from, from listening to God, your creator. The Lord is my shepherd, but have you met with him? And so real quick, that it's, it's similar to a phone. Uh, you know, let's just say you're dating someone, maybe you, your fiancé, and it's a long-distance relationship, and, and you're like, this phone is great. You know why? Because I can talk to a fiancé on it. And, 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 and the more I talk, the, the closer I get to my fiancé. Okay, the, all right, the phone's important, but it's only important as you are meeting with that person, as you're connecting with that person through that phone. That's the only value of it. And this book is not going to do you any good if it's sitting on your nightstand, right? Or even if you're reading it in, in, a, in a just cursory way and not saying, God, please speak to me. Please meet with me. Please talk to me. And talking to him as Mueller prayed on his knees before an open Bible every day until he found his soul happy in God. That's the key. That's it. It is a remarkable, experiential walk with God. Reading this, I would encourage all of us to begin the new year reading this, The Pursuit of God. A.W. Tozer talks about the, the problem with just a mere academic reading of the Bible and not reading, God, reading the Bible to meet with God. And we can, we can slip into that. We can slip into that. God's presence is our ultimate delight. And that ends with this, verses 27 and 28. Then God's presence is the best decision. And, and so he's pitting these two together. He's like, okay, the wicked, and they're going this way, and they have temporal happy circumstances, but you know what? It's no lasting delight, and there's eternal punishment and judgment for it. And so I can find my delight in God despite my circumstances, and so that's why he says this is the best decision to meet with God, to find my delight in God. Verse 27, for behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, right, and he begins that way. Did you get that phrase at the very beginning? Uh, verse 1 and 2. He's totally changed his thinking. Verse 1 and 2, he's like, everybody thinks God's good to Israel. But as for me, I'm having a really hard time thinking God's good to Israel. Or he might be good to Israel, but he's not good to me. And he's totally changed his thinking now that he's spent some time with God. Dwelling on who God is, delighting in God. Then by the end, he's able to say, God's going to destroy those who are unfaithful to you. Verse 20, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. He knows that the greatest delight of his soul is the, the nearness of God. The nearness of God. So I pray that that will be our refrain this new year. Oh God, draw me nearer to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a promise. Can we pray that in closing? Let's all pray that, and that would be so much grace if you can, with all your heart, cry out, Oh God, 
Uh, forgive me for trying to find delight in all these other things. Thank you for them. I'm thankful that, like, I have health. And, and I can eat. And, like, a, a wonderful family, beautiful wife, right? I'm thankful for these things. But, Lord, please help me to find my ultimate life's joy as nearness with you as my ultimate good. Can we read this out loud together? Verse 28. Uh, verse 28. We're going to try to memorize this. We're going to say it again next week. Verse 28. We'll read it out loud together. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. I hope you can meditate on that this week. And next week we're going to meditate through Psalm 4. It's a shorter psalm, but a similar refrain. Let's close in prayer, and as we do, just take a moment to pray this to the Lord. If you don't know the Lord through Jesus, and you don't have forgiveness of sins, please talk to me. I'll be standing in the back lobby. In a moment, Pastor Andrew will close us in prayer. But it's time, time to start the new year off that way, in Christ. And for all of us who know the Lord, let's have this as our prayer. Oh Lord, draw me nearer to you. Help me delight in you this year. Uh, is my ultimate joy. Let's pray. Glorious God, you have created us with a desire for permanent and infinite delight. And you offer yourself to us as the source of that permanent, infinite delight. We thank you for who you are, how you've designed us to need you, and to find what we need in you. And we confess that we are easily turned away from looking at you to many other things. We are jealous of others who have temporary prosperity. We live in a distracted and idolatrous time, and we are distracted and idolatrous people. And so we pray that you would use your word today and the rest of this day and the beginning of this year. You would help us to reset, to recalibrate our focus to see you as the center of the reason for a living. Help us to find in you permanent and infinite delight. And in doing so, we are given what we need to serve and to do what you've called us to do and to give and to live to represent you because we have God. We pray for your grace for these things. We pray that your word would continue to impact us and help us to see that your nearness is our good. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.